So just want to welcome everybody in person and online and just want to say um, how much we appreciate you and also just want to say thank you so much to everyone who donated to the Life School Golf Tournament. We were able to raise almost $41,000. We, still, we, we um, still need to raise $60,000, but you know, that, that, that's part of the, uh, what's that? No, no, 16 is a goal. And so we still need to raise that $60,000 because that's one of the things that happens when you have 2,800 pastors in your program, thank God. And it also was just like, okay, how are we going to do this? But if, you know, I just so appreciate every single person, all the golfers who played and everyone who sacrificially gave and, and just really were generous in their donations. It means so much to dad. It means so much to me. Just um, how much we got behind this and uh, just donated sacrificially. And so if you, um, I know people, I know all of us are so incredibly busy, both here and online. If you haven't yet donated to this golf tournament, I just want to encourage you to be generous and to ask the Lord, Lord, how much would you want me to give? And even if it's a small gift or even if it's a big gift, every gift counts and every gift matters. And so... Um, this is this is the Great Commission. This is making a bride ready. Twenty eight hundred pastors helping them, and all all throughout East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, Congo, South Africa. Um, just that God is making His bride ready. And so, if you haven't yet given and would like to give, uh, the the link should be shown on the screen. Is give dot lifeschoolinternational.org give dot lifeschoolinternational.org and I would so appreciate your donation you know probably getting to sixty thousand dollars is probably not going to happen but if we could get to fifty thousand dollars if we could get raise nine thousand more dollars to hit our goal that would be awesome so if you would like to if you're hearing this even if you're online if you're hearing this and would like to donate, we would so appreciate your donation. All the money goes directly to funding pastors in East Africa. So thank you for listening to that. So anyway, um, and I, I thought we had a great tournament, and Randall's team, he stacked his team. I mean, he had, he had like, you know, if you follow college football, he had nil deals going on to get five-star golfers on his team. And, I mean, he, they had a record 19-under par in the tournament. So that, that means you have to get birdie, if you know golf, that means you have to get birdie on every single hole or less, and that's what they did, 19 under, that's just ridiculous. So anyway, Randall is, if you know Randall, he's super competitive, and he dominated the field. So congratulations to Randall. Yeah, yeah, Randall donated the first prize and then won it by loading his team. Not, not that... I'm not, that was dad that was accusing, I'm not accusing him of that, but I mean, I don't know, I mean, I would check into that. So anyway, so let's, let's go ahead and let's turn to John chapter 15, verses, verse 9, and we're, we're continuing on the Indwelling Life series, you know, the Lord's going to return and we're going to be on like session 115. Uh, this is Renewing the Mind, session 16, Renew, Renewing the Mind, part 5, we've kind of gotten into this series within a series here of really drilling into renewing the mind and the importance of renewing the mind and what happens when we renew the mind, the importance of uh, it, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed, be metamorpho, be transformed, change state like a caterpillar to a butterfly by the renewing of your mind, the, the importance of changing the way we think and thinking about what we think about is, is so vital. And so this is uh, session 16, part 5, Renewing the Mind. And Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 9, He said, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Now, just think about that for a second. Jesus said, The way the Father has loved me, the passion that the Lord, ha the Father has for Jesus, is the same love that He has for you. Isn't that incredible? If you ever struggle with God's love, we're going to get into this more in this session, but if you ever struggle, does God love me? Jesus says, the way the Father has loved me, I have loved you. And he was talking to his disciples, but I believe he was also, by implication, 
uh, talking to his people that would be in him. He loved, Jesus Christ loves us just like the Father loves him. That's incredible. And the, and, and the Lord said, abide in my love. Remain in my love. Well, how do you do that? How do you abide in his love? How do you remain in the Lord's love? The Lord says in the next statement, if you keep my commandments, if you obey, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Obedience is critical to the abiding life. You can't just live in the flesh and live to do what you want to do and how you want to do it and how you want it done and think you're going to live the abiding life. No, the abiding life hinges upon obedience. Hinges upon obedience. The Lord just said it right there. If you obey, then you will abide. If you will obey, then you will abide. Obedience is critical. Obedience is critical. Don't think that we can just, you know, say a prayer and live how we want to live and not think obedience is critical. Obedience is critical. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3. We're, this is really going to be our focus for the next, this session and the next several sessions when Paul was writing to the Corinthians and he was talking about the way we think, the importance connecting the way we think to how we obey. There, there is a direct correlation between our thoughts and our actions. And I talked about that last, last week, that it starts with beliefs in the heart, it flows into thinking in the mind, and it leads into action. Now, Paul unpacks this for us here to the Corinthians, and he's talking to the carnal Corinthians. They were carnal. They, they were saved, but they were, they were living carnal lives for the most part. And Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Okay, what are you, Paul, what are you talking about? So if you think about it, the Corinthians would look up and they would see their, their, they would see city walls. It was very common, very common analogy for cities to be surrounded by walls. And these walls were like 15 feet, I think they were like 15 feet wide and, and 20, or no, 25 feet, uh, hold on, I got it in here, it's... Uh, Anyway, I'll get into it in a minute. They were big. They were really, really, really big. <laughs> I'll, I, I'm making it, you know, uh, for children. They were big walls. Okay. And Paul is saying these walls, these massive walls, what were these walls that Paul's saying we are going to destroy? Now, I love that aggressive language that Paul's saying we're going to destroy these things. What are they? He says next, he says, we are destroying speculations. We're destroying every, now think, speculations is, is a function of the mind. In fact, that word means reasoning. Paul is saying we're destroying reasoning. We're destroying thinking patterns. We're destroying uh, systems of thought. We're destro destroying patterns of thinking that have been lodged into your mind. We are destroying those things and every lofty thing, and it's related to the thinking of people, raised up, listen, against the knowledge of God. What is Paul's focus? Anything that is raised up against the knowledge of who he is, is we are attacking not with physical war, fair weapons, but we are attacking with spiritual weapons, and that spiritual weapon is the two-edged sword of God's Word that is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. God's living and active Word is coming to divide and wage war against strongholds in the mind. Can you say mental strongholds? God wants to come and, and break down and destroy mental strongholds that are keeping God out and keeping you in, but, but limiting the amount of his life from flowing in you and through you. We are destroying uh, strongholds. We are destroying speculations. We are destroying every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. 
Now listen to what Paul said. And we are taking every thought, every thought, not just 90% of the thoughts, not just five or 10 thoughts, every single thought that comes into your mind, Paul's saying, is you must take those thoughts and make them submissive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ unto obedience to him, unto full obedience to him. He says, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is what he says. We are ready to punish all disobedience. Talking about the, I believe he was looking forward, looking towards even the end time judgments of God. We are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. See, the, the Christian life, bridal, we talk about bridal readiness, the bride making herself ready. The bride making herself ready, what does that look like? It looks like complete obedience. It looks like full obedience. It looks like absolute adherence to what hit the Lord has said in his word, that we are going to fully, wholeheartedly obey every word God has spoken, both in his word and in his voice to us. Paul is saying that we are ready to, we are ready to punish with apostolic authority every work of disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Well, how does our obedience become complete? It becomes complete by taking, taking our thinking, our thought patterns, our heart beliefs, our, our mental reasoning, what we think about as a man thinks in his heart, so he is, those thinking patterns and bringing them unto submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ unto full obedience, which is bridal readiness. So do you see the link here? I just want to, I want to make sure we see the link between the way you think and the way you obey. If you're going to obey the Lord, you got to think like the Lord. You got to think like him. If you're going to obey God, you got to think like God. If you're going to obey the spirit, you got to think like the spirit. If you're going to obey the word, you got to think like the word. If you're thinking like the world and your mind is being conformed to the spirit of this age, you're not going to obey the Lord because the way you think is going to determine the way you live. The way you think is going to determine how you obey. And so Paul was saying to the Corinthians, there are fortresses. There are strongholds. There's these massive walls that you have, Corinthians, that are fleshly in nature, nature, even demonically in nature, uh, that, are, that are built up by thinking patterns that are actually blocking God. They're raised up against the knowledge of God. They're blocking God. They're blocking the inward life of Christ in you from flowing out of you. They're hindering the flow of the Spirit of God. And we are waging war on strongholds, strongholds in the mind. Amen. Now, Again, when, when Paul said in this passage, he said that we're destroying speculations, that word in the Greek means reckoning, computation, or reasoning. It's, it, these are mindsets of the flesh. They're thinking patterns that contend against the knowledge of God. And so Paul was, Paul's audience, the Corinthians, are very familiar with these cities. Oh, I've got it here in my notes now. Not, I can move from being big, big walls. These walls were like 15 to 25 feet thick. So you could, you, could ride a whole, you could ride a chariot on top of these walls, and they were over 25 feet high. And so these, these walls, these thinking patterns, were, were keeping God out because these thinking patterns were, were established in the Corinthians, and these patterns of thought rooted between the connection. We talked about this last Sunday. That there's that heart-mind connection, that connection with what you believe in your heart and how you think in your mind, that heart-mind connection there. Paul's saying this heart-mind connection, these strongholds are blocking God from moving in your life because you're thinking in accordance, to, to, uh, in accordance that's contrary to the knowledge of God. 
And Paul's saying we are coming with divinely strong, powerful weapons, the word of God, that's a two-edged sword, to break down strongholds. And so, just I, I, I just talked about this in the notes here, or meant to put this in the notes, that they're, they're, if, if, these are complex. Th these thinking patterns are complex. They're, they're not just... I had one bad thought, but there's a system and a pattern of thinking that we've established over, over decades of living, especially if you're over a decade. There are decades of living that have formed this heart-mind connection where heart beliefs are feeding the mind. The mind is in turn forming arguments and reasonings of patterns of thinking, and these patterns of thinking are then uh, creating mental strongholds that affect your emotions, affect your will, affect your body, and in, in the, in, at the end of the day, determine whether you're obedient to Christ or not. See, if you're obedient to Christ, it's because you think like he does. If you're disobedient to Christ, it's because you don't think like he does. Your obedience is determined by how you think. So it's very important that we learn how to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so Paul really, I just want to drill on this again in Romans 8, 5. Turn to Romans 8, chapter 5. I just want us, I just want us to see this in Scripture over and over and over, what Paul was, was saying, the importance of it. The, just, just let it just sink into your heart. For those who are according to the flesh, those who are living in the flesh, those who are fleshly, those who are living according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. If you think about your, your body and you think about your soul and you think about the external world, if your mind is set on those things out there and even your own self, getting what you want, when you want it, how you want it, if your mind is set upon those things, Paul said, you're... There's no, I can't help you. You're going to, because it's a spiritual law, you are going to live by the flesh. If you think according to the flesh, you're going to live by the flesh, and there's nothing I can do to help you. The only thing I can do is say, change your thinking. Change your mind from thinking about the flesh to thinking about the spirit, because he says next, but those who are according to the Spirit, those who live by the Spirit, those who live from the Holy Spirit and live from their new spirit, those who live from their spirit are setting their mind on the things of the Spirit. Romans 8, 6. The mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Just remember always that your meditation determines your orientation. What you meditate upon determines the part of you you live from. If you think about those things that are according to your flesh and getting what your flesh wants, living a selfish life, living by self-life, living what self wants, the way it wants it, how it wants it done, if you live based on that, you're going to live in the flesh, and you can't please God. Therefore, if we want to live from the Spirit, by the Spirit, we've got to change the way we think. We've got to change our meditation. The mind must be renewed. In fact, in Ephesians 4, 22-24, Paul said, Put off the old man that is in a present state of corruption by lust. You could be saved for 50 years and your body and when your soul is in alignment with your body is in a state of corruption that's ever being corrupted by lust and it will not be fixed until your body is raised from the dead. And Paul's saying, don't take off that old man, that old nature. Put on the new man. Put on the new creation that has been, past tense, created in righteousness, the very same righteousness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness of Jesus Christ, your spirit has been created in that righteousness. Your spirit is just as righteous as he, his, he is. You have his very own righteousness transmitted into your spirit. Your spirit has been 
created in righteousness and holiness um, and in, in, in the image and the likeness of God. And Paul says, put off the old man, put on the new man. Well, how do you do it? Paul says in verse 23, by, the re by renewing the spirit of your mind. You, make a, a, you change your state from the flesh to the spirit by renewing your mind. You've got to be intentional about meditation. You've got to be intentional about what you think about. You've got to be intentional about pondering and thinking upon those things that are based on the word of God. And so what we're going to be doing here over the next several weeks is we're going to be looking at, at several different carnal mindsets. What I find fleshly, carnal mindsets that are common that probably every one of us here have or do struggle with. And we're going to, we're going to talk about what these mindsets are, these strongholds are, so that we can see these demolished in your mind, in my mind, so that we can live more and more by the Spirit of God. Remember this, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's in the knowing of the truth that you experience freedom. If you're living in bondage, if you're living in bondage to sin, it could be a million things. Lust, immorality, adultery, pornography, jealousy, envy, judgment, criticism. It could be a million things. Coveting, comparing, uh, you know, again, just so many different things you could be living in bondage to. Jesus said, if you want to be set free, then you've got to know the truth. The truth sets you free. The truth sets you free. And so uh, this, this, the, for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about mental strongholds and we're confronting them with the truth so that you can experience the freedom and the liberty that God has for you so his life can then flow freely through you without hindrance, without anything blocking or hindering the free flow of God's life from your innermost being. Okay. Now, you're going to listen to this, and you're going to be like, okay, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. You know, you're going to listen about, I don't know how many we're going to go through, six, seven, eight, ten. We're talking about unworthiness. We're going to talk about rejection. We're going to talk about uh, lust, pride, coveting, things like that. And you're probably going to be like, okay, that's me, that's me, that's me. If these mindsets describe you, I just want to just give you some upfront uh, advice here, is do not get discouraged or condemned. Okay, don't get discouraged or condemned because God wants to set you free. God wants to break through and set you free. Stay confident. Stay confident. The Lord is going to set you free. If you learn to think differently, if you learn to, to put into practice thinking differently, renewing your mind, the Lord is going to set you free. Take responsibility for the thoughts in your mind and the beliefs in your heart. Sometimes we just want to put all the blame on the devil and say, well, the devil did this and the devil put this in my mind. No. I mean, yes, he did. Um, don't get me wrong. Yes, it's very real. But at the end of the day, you've got a responsibility. If he is putting those thoughts into your mind, you need to resist him and rebuke him. You've got to take responsibility. I've got to take responsibility for the thoughts in my mind and the beliefs in my heart and not put the, all the blame on the devil. If you are experiencing outside attack or even de uh, demonization, you've got to take responsibility to get set free and to resist the devil. Jot down areas in your life that need to change. Ask the Holy Spirit to identify the heart beliefs that have led to where you are. Lord, why am I like this? Why do I keep struggling with this sin? Why do I keep why can't I experience the breakthrough? Why can't I experience the liberty? Why can't I get victory over anxiety and worry? Why do I keep struggling with coveting and jealousy and envy? Why do I struggle with this root of rejection that manifests in judgment and criticism and, you know, rejecting others and, you know, being too kept to myself and, you know, just all the different fruits of rejection? Why do I struggle with this? 
Ask the Lord to show you, okay, what are those beliefs deep, deep down that, are on, that you have you on autopilot that are directing you to where you're going without you even realizing it? Oh, I'm going in this direction because I'm believing these certain things. Ask the Lord to show you what these lies are you're believing. When did they come in? How did they form? What happened here? Ask the Lord to show you. And then, and I'm going to give you some practical examples as we go through these different strongholds. Then begin to change your heart beliefs by spending time meditating upon the truth where these lies have prevailed. Okay, hear me on this. You can't just come up and ask me to lay hands or ask dad or ask one of the elders to lay hands on you and say, change this mindset. It's not how it works. Now, I think you can do as a catalyst to kick it off. You've got to take action. Paul said, renew your mind. You've got to take action. I've got to take action. I've got to be proactive. If I'm just wanting God to sit here and change me, it's not going to happen. Paul said, Paul gave an apostolic command, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're not putting in the work and the effort, then you're never going to be transformed. So take responsibility for your own transformation and your own mental, what's going on here in your mind. You've got to take responsibility for that. Okay. If you've done all of that, and you're still struggling in your thoughts and still struggling to overcome sin, then you might need deliverance from demons. And so I would also encourage you as we go through this, if you feel like, okay, Lord, I've done all this, okay, don't just come up and say, you know, I'm struggling, I need deliverance. Maybe you do, but have you done the steps needed to prepare for that? Have you really taken, you know, have you put into practice what I'm saying here Change your own beliefs. Change your mind. Renew your mind. If you've done all that and you really, really are serious about it and you're still struggling, then maybe you need deliverance. And now that, if you do that, if you do need deliverance, then we would be happy to do deliverance on you. But that's a different subject. What I'm saying in this teaching really is to get you proactively engaged in renewing your mind so that the truth can set you free. Amen. Does that make sense? Okay. The first one we're going to look at is a stronghold of unworthiness. A stronghold of unworthiness. Probably all of us have struggled with this at one time or another. Is psychiatrists teach that most of the beliefs, most of the beliefs we have are rooted in, in three different lies that say, I'm helpless, I'm worthless, and I'm unlovable. And if you really break it down, a lot of times that's the way we feel. We're, we're feeling, we feel as if we're unlovable, we're feeling worthless. We're feeling as if we are helpless. And those lead to all, those, those beliefs that are so deeply ingrained in our heart begin to produce this feeling of unworthiness that, that the Lord can't love a person like me. Now, you know, unworthiness, I think, can be rooted in three different things. Unworthiness can be rooted in deep sin. Unworthiness can be rooted in rejection, and unworthiness can be re, uh, rooted in abuse. And so let's just talk through some of those right now. Unworthiness rooted in deep sin. All of us have a past. All of us have a past. All of us have, you know, hope, some of us have a deeper past than others, but all of us have you know, done things. Some of us have a deeper past than others. But if you've been involved in deep sin, you know, whether, whether you sinned when you were saved, whether you were, you know, whether you got into sin when you were saved or whether you were you before you were saved, all of us have this, 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 not all of us, some of us have a deep, dark past of sin. It could be deep things, whether it's, you know, an affair or an abortion or, you know, you instigated a divorce, you're addicted to pornography, you have homosexual desires, you're, you know, have perverted fantasies, you have a bondage to alcohol, cigarettes, or drugs. I mean, it could be deep, deep stuff, immorality, adultery. It could be a deep, deep stuff. And the feeling that we can have from those deep, dark things is we can feel as if we are unworthy to God. And that can create a whole chain of condemnation, condemnation, guilt, and shame for what I've done in the past. 
And it's kind of like the, the, the son in the parable of the prodigal child who he goes off, he has this inheritance, he goes off and he squanders it living with the pigs. And he, you know, he goes and he spends all this time living and living up with prostitutes and living in sin and all these different things. And he says, he comes back and he says, I am unworthy to even be called your son. Now, how many of us have ever felt that way because of our past, because of what we have done, because of what we, the, you know, the, the deep, dark things we have done? And the incredible thing about this is God's, the Father's love for us in this parable is the Father sees him and runs after him and, and meets him and, and he hugs him and, and you know, puts his embrace around him. And the father puts upon him his best robe, a ring and sandals. And the son and the father says, I, basically, I love you, son, and I always have and I always will. See, that's God's love for you. That's God's love for you no matter the depth of your past, no matter what you have done, no matter the, the sin you have been involved in, no matter what has been you have engaged in, God's love for you, if you turn back to him, is the love of the Father to show compassion upon you and to say to you, you are worthy to be called my son or my daughter. That's the love of God. That's God's love for you. See, it's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy it, it, for, for those things we've done to think I am, I'm way too wretched of a person to approach a holy God of transcendence. I'm way too wretched of a person. So I have these nonstop thoughts of guilt, shame, and condemnation. And so what happens is these things make you feel worthless and unlovable. See, when you think this way, you feel like I am a hopeless hypocrite. I'm never going to ever be able to please God condemnation is just surrounding your mind, constant thoughts of guilt for what you've done. You've struggled for this for years and you can't get victory over this and you feel as if, God, I can never ever be the person you want me to be. I can never be the bride made ready that's been talked about. And you know what? If you think that way, there's some truth to it. That's why you've got to get victory over unworthiness. And how do you get victory over unworthiness for a deep, dark past is you've got to go back. I would recommend go back to session 13 where we talked about living from victory, where God pronounces over you, you are justified in Jesus Christ. You have received the gift of imputed righteousness. That gift of imputed righteousness is imputed to you. So God looks at you in Christ and says, you are righteous in my son. And that gift of imputed righteousness then translates to the Father saying to you, you are just as if you had never sinned. You are righteous in the matter and you have been pardoned. That's the love of God in Christ is that he breaks the power of sin in your life by, by saying it has been forgiven and you have been given a status of righteousness in him. And that comes before sanctification. That comes before obedience. That comes by faith. It is by, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, that we receive that gift of imputed righteousness that breaks the power of sin that says you're a hopeless hypocrite, you're never going to get victory, you're never going to overcome, you're never going to be the kind of person I've called you to be because you have sinned way too much in the past and even you're sinning right now, you think that way, I'm sinning now. And God says, no, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses your conscience cleanses you deep, deep inside from accusations of, of condemnation, accusations that I'm not good enough, and he sets you free by the blood of Jesus Christ. Meditate on that. If, if, your, if your past is, is filled with sin, meditate that Jesus Christ has set you free. Now, if you're living in sin, you obviously need to repent. I'm not condoning sin. If you're looking at pornography, if you're living in immorality, you need to repent. But... Once you repent, God looks at you and says, I forgive your sins. Don't wallow around in that mess. I forgive your sins. See, unworthiness can also be rooted in abuse. See, it's not sometimes you feel unworthy, not because of what you did, but what someone did to you. 
And so, you know, if you've been the victim of verbal, sexual, emotional, or physical abuse, it, it, it would be natural, it would be natural to struggle with thoughts of unworthiness, to feel shame for what was done to you, to feel shame almost as if I'm, sh I'm ashamed of who I even am. It, you know, that would be a natural thing to do. And so, it, you know, you can even develop this mindset that what, what happened to me was well-deserved because I'm unworthy. It can make you feel dirty. It can make you feel ugly and make you want to withdraw from the presence of God. And so, you know, if, if, you've been, if you feel unworthy because of what has been done to you, the, the, I think the greatest remedy, one of the greatest remedies, probably the greatest remedy, is knowing God's love. God, knowing God's love, there is, there is you know, it, it's imperative not that we move from just a a knowledge of God's love, that we can quote the scriptures and we can quote the Bible verses and all that, but we move into what I, that, that, I pray, I, that, that scripture I, I, stayed, I said at the beginning where Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Personalize that. Say it back to the Lord. Say it back to the Lord. Father, Jesus, you love me. Jesus, you love me just like the Father loves you. And that love is infinite. That love is, is so beyond words. That is the way God loves you. That's the way God feels about you. So if you struggle with unworthiness because of what was done to you, it could be a, so many different things. If you struggle with that, begin to internalize and verbalize the fact that, that, that God's, God, Jesus Christ, loves you just like the Father loves you, say it out loud, confess it in your prayer time. Say, Lord, you love me, Jesus, just like the Father loves you. And Father, and uh, this is John uh, chapter 17, 23, Father, Jesus said that you love us just like you love Jesus. The Father and the Son, the way they love each other is the same way they love you. And, and just begin to confess it, begin to meditate on it, begin to ponder it, begin to reflect upon it, and, and go deep in it. Just make it, the, make it the air you live by, make it the oxygen you survive on. That, that is God's incredible love for you that sets you free, sets you free from unworthiness, sets you free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. You are God's beloved. You are the one. You, you, the Lord says about you, this is my beloved. My desire is for you. And a lot of times you, you don't even you feel like I can't even, I don't even believe that. I can't even believe that's even real. No, it's real. It's real. When, you, when God's love moves from knowledge to experience, that's when you are beginning to be set free. That's what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3. He was prayed that you might know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that love of God has to be experienced. It cannot be communicated. I cannot stand up here and try to give you five points that describe God's love. You can't read three Bible verses that talk about God's love. God's love has to be experienced. God's love has to be experienced. And when you experience his love, nothing even compares to it. Now remember... Many years ago, back in the mid-90s, I, 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 was, I was struggling with all the stuff I'm talking about, guilt, shame, condemnation, rejection, unworthiness, and it was like I went through a year where the Lord was just showering me with his love, and it was just, I was just, I never ever cried except during football games when Georgia won, and so I was crying like every single day almost, it felt like, just listening to a worship song, and I'm like, oh, Jesus loves me. And, you know, I would go to people and be, my eyes would be like bloodshot red from crying. And I'd be like, Jesus loves me. And like, yeah, you learned about that in VBS as, three, as a third grader. But it wasn't until the experience came in and the, the experience of God's love penetrated me and I felt it and the waves of God's love washed over me and I began just to feel his love. Like Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, that's when I began to experience the most transformation I've ever experienced because God was setting me free. I mean, pretty much all these strongholds I've, I'm going to talk about are strongholds that I myself have, you know, struggled with at some point. You know, 
uh, unworthiness and rejection and, you know, whatever, all these things. So, you know, just it's the love of God. It's the baptism, the fresh the fresh touch of God's love that comes upon you, that experience, that you experience it, that you experience that baptism into his love. If you struggle with a feeling of unworthiness, whether it's because of your past or whether because of what was done to you, I just want to encourage you to pray Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Just pray that daily. Pray that daily. Pray it daily that, that you would... That, Lord, let me experience the, the love of God that is beyond knowledge, that goes beyond the height and length and width and the breadth, so that I can experience that. See, um, another, another, root of re, another root of unworthiness is rejection. If you've been rejected, if you've been the victim of infidelity or abandonment or withheld love or condemning words or oppressive parental discipline, spousal control, trauma, whatever it could be, just if you've experienced rejection, then, also, then you begin to also feel unworthy. You can have that feeling of unworthiness. And so if you have those feelings of unworthiness, don't just, you know, listen, to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ, you, cannot, you can't just stay in unworthy, unworthiness. You've got to press through it and, and experience the love of God. So if, if you're struggling with those things, I've got in the notes here, I've got in the notes here some verses that are focused on God's love for you. I'll, I'll just read through some of these real quick. I just encourage you to, to meditate on these, confess these, sing these, write these. Remember, meditation cannot just be thought about. Meditation has to be voiced. Meditation has to be prayed. Meditation has to be sung. Meditation has to be written. Is John 17, 23, where, where the, the Father said, you love them even as you have loved me. God loves you even as he has loved Jesus. The Father loves you even as he has loved Jesus. Lord, let that be, and turn it into a prayer, Lord, let this be a reality that I experience, that I know that is not just on paper or on a tablet, but it's something I've experienced, I've tasted, and I, I can feel it where God himself says over you, you are beloved and you are chosen. And he says it about you personally. He personalizes it to you. Just keep meditating and concentrating on that until you experience it. John 15, verse 9, Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Jesus, the bridegroom, says to you, I love you. You are my delight. You are my chosen one. You are my beloved. And, and a lot of times you're like, I don't even believe it. It's true. And if you struggle even believing it, if you struggle even accepting it about yourself, you know, keep pressing in and keep meditating on this until finally you experience it and finally you believe it. God loves me. Personalize that. That's the way God, the God of all, the God of love, feels about you. Uh, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Make this your prayer. If you struggle with un unworthiness, if you struggle with unworthiness, make this your prayer. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth I said, Lord, let me experience this to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Oh, that is an incredible statement. It surpasses knowledge. It cannot be boiled down to five-point sermons. It cannot be boiled down to you memorizing a verse about it. It's so incredible. You have to experience it. And when you do, you're filled with the fullness of God. I got some others in here, but I'm just going to just read Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If you struggle with unworthiness, hear these words of God spoken to you. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God himself, who commands angel armies in heaven, is for you. Who can be against you? He did not spare his own son for you. 
or he did not spare his own son, but he delivered himself, delivered the Son of God over to you freely. How will he not give you freely all things? Who is it that brings a charge against you, God's elect, who have been chosen in Jesus Christ? Who brings that charge against you? It's not God. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't correct you. It doesn't mean he doesn't discipline you. It doesn't mean he doesn't lead you on to the straight and the narrow path. But God is not accusing you. God is not condemning you. He's for you. God is the one who justifies you. God is the one who declares you righteous. God is the one who says, my beloved one who has been chosen of me in my son, chosen in Christ, I declare that you are righteous in Jesus Christ. Your past has been forgiven. Your sins have been washed. You are now in a state of righteousness in Jesus Christ. Meditate on that. Who is the one who condemns? Well, I'll tell you, he's the accuser of the brethren. And he's, he, he really has duped a lot of Christians into believing that God is... Now, again, I'm, I'm, if you're living in sin, you need to repent. I'm not... Please understand, I'm not saying, I'm not giving you a license to sin. If you're living in sin, you need to repent. But assuming you're not living in sin, the one who's accusing you, the one who is condemning you is the devil. It's not God. He's not condemning you over your past. He's not condemning you over the things you did. Jesus Christ is the one who died for you, who was raised up, who is at the right hand of God, who's interceding for you. Listen, what... This is what Paul says. Who is going to separate you from the love of Christ? What can separate you from the love of Christ? Well, tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all of these things, personalize this, this scripture verse. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Personalize this for yourself. I want to encourage you, every one of us, take Romans 8, 31 through 39 and personalize it. Don't just read it as a theology, but read it as if God himself is, that God himself is prophesying over you. That he says over you, just put your name, I'm just going to put my name here, just put your name. Brian, in all these things, you overwhelmingly conquer because I have loved you like the Father has loved me and because he, the Father, loves you just like he's loved me. Brian, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate you, Brian, from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read just a little bit from the beginning again. Personalize it. Just personalize this verse. Brian, if God is for you, who can be against you? Brian, I did not spare my own son, but I delivered him over for you. How will I not freely give you all things? Who is going to bring a charge against you, Brian, because you're chosen in Jesus Christ? Brian, I am the one who justifies you. Brian, I say to you, beloved, and I say to you, chosen, and I say to you, righteous in Jesus Christ. I say to you that nothing will separate you from my love. You see how I'm, what I'm doing? That's, that's what I want to just encourage you to do, is, is get into this act of biblical meditation where you're taking these texts and you're not just studying them theologically and you're not just studying them for knowledge. Though those, that's good to do, but you're, you're taking it and you're personalizing it and you're turning it into a prophecy that God's speaking over you, just imagine as if there was a, a prophet who never missed one word. He was 100% accurate. And, God, and he just prophesied Romans 8 to you. And, and just envision that, that this, this is the word of the Lord to me, and you personalize it, and you interact with God as you're reading it, and you're taking time just to feel the love of God, and you go, oh, Lord, I feel your love. I feel 
your love for me. There's nothing like it, Lord. Lord, who is against me? You're for me. You justify me. Who's going to bring a charge against your elect? You know, just, I just encourage you to do that. It, just to focus these scriptures that focus on God's love and personalize those for yourself. Also, unworthiness. Focus on scriptures that talk about the, the gift of righteousness, imputed righteousness, justification. And again, personalize those. I'm just going to take Romans 5, 9 and just say this about yourself. Much more than the Lord says to you, Brian, much more than having now been justified by his blood, having been declared righteous, your past sins washed away, you now having a state, a status of righteousness, you are now declared righteous as you are going to be saved from the wrath of God. And the notes have a bunch more scriptures here, but for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them. Just focus on these verses about you being a child of God. Just like, for example, Ephesians 1.5. Lord, you predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of your will. Lord, I am your child. Father, you are my father. I am your child. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with my spirit. I am a child of God. I am an heir of God and a fellow heir with Jesus Christ. For I am all, we are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Begin to meditate on these things. Begin to meditate on these realities, beautiful realities. And what will happen is your life will begin to change. Take these verses I've given you and turn them into a prayer that you pray regularly. Here's an example here. That I, that I, a prayer that I, and I have it in the notes, of, of what I'm trying to teach you is, is take these scriptures, personalize them to you as, as if God himself is speaking this over you, because he is, he is. And then turn it into a prayer that helps you meditate upon these things so that you, so that you don't struggle with this feeling of unworthiness. Like, for example, I took, you know, taking these, these different things about God's love, I'm a child of God, and God justifies me. Here's a prayer I came up with. Just do it. I encourage you to do it yourself. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and I thank you that you love me just as much as you love Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you that, that as the Father has loved you, you have loved me. That no matter what I have done in the past, I am forgiven, I am justified, and I am declared righteous because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Father, I am your child with the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I am your beloved whom you desire. Lord God, I declare that you are for me and not against me. Nothing shall ever separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ my Lord. Father God, you declare me righteous in Christ, destroying all guilt, shame, and condemnation. Therefore, there is no one who can condemn me. Father, I pray that you would root and ground me in the love of Christ. Let me experience your love that is beyond explanation. Let me experience the length and the width and the breadth and the height of your infinite love for me. Even though I don't feel worthy to be called your child, you have made me your very own. I am a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And because of your great love for me, you put your best robe upon me, a ring on my finger and sandals on my feet. You celebrate me with joy. You love me. You like me. You enjoy me. Thank you, God. See, I just want to, I'm just encouraging this a practical, practical way. Whatever it is you're struggling with, if it's unworthiness, and we'll get into other ones later, let the word of God be the, that force that destroys strongholds, reasoning, logical thinking, thinking patterns that are raised up against the knowledge of God by declaring God's word for you, by prophesying God's word to you, by meditating it over you and, and just getting it into your prayer life, into your conversation with the Lord. See, and as you do this, what happens is, is as you do this over time, it doesn't, you can't just do it once and think, well, it didn't work. Well, no, you've got to do it over time. You've got to plant 
these, these truths into your heart, as you begin to do this over time, as you begin to do this day in and day out as a lifestyle, get into this conversation with God, what happens is you begin to change. What happens is you begin to believe it. You begin to believe the truth rather than the lie. And as you believe the truth rather than the lie, your thinking begins to change, your actions begin to change, and Christ, his life in you begins to live in you and to flow through you. So I just encourage you, do your homework. Do your homework. Take these scriptures, meditate on them, turn them into a prayer, and experience God's love for you. He is for you and not against you. And his love and his, the power of justification breaks the feeling of unworthiness so that you can live in freedom and victory. Amen. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we want to thank you. Lord, we want to thank you for the victory that is in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love. Let us never, ever, ever, Lord, ever take for granted your love. Let your love wash over us. Let us experience the depth of your love, Lord, we pray, that we could have a greater and greater experience of the love of God that surpasses knowledge, we pray. And I just pray, Lord, for everyone listening to this message, whether in person or online, that they would know the truth and the truth would make them free, that they could experience the freedom and the liberty that is in Jesus Christ. I pray for victory and breakthrough. Lord, that you would smash through every stronghold, that there might be liberty and breakthrough in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We'll end the online.